Hello everyone, good afternoon to you if you're joining us uh, in Europe and good morning if you're joining us in the US. My name is Alistair Wheat, I uh, lead the strategy and a product strategy here at Analytica and today I'm going to be doing a webinar on three ways to start a B2B influencer engagement program. So you can see my uh, contact details there on the screen, I'm Al Wheat on Twitter and uh, my email address is there, we'd love to hear from you after this if you've got any questions about what I'm talking about uh, during this webinar. So just to give a quick uh, overview of what we're going to do, I'll give a quick introduction to us as a company if you haven't uh, come across us before. Um, then I'm going to talk a bit about um, preparation, so what do, you, what do B2B marketers need to do in order to get ready to start looking at influencer engagement. I'll look a bit at the uh, paid versus the organic engagement discussion, and then I'm going to look at uh, three models for how to get started in influencer engagement in the B2B context. I've got a couple of case studies to share and then also some supporting materials. Uh, throughout the course of this webinar, if you've got any questions, uh, do feel free just to uh, post the questions in the Bright Talk panel or you can tweet us at Analytica. Um, you can tweet at me, although I probably won't spot it because I'll be uh, doing the presentation, but I'll be happy to pick up any questions posed directly to me um, after the webinar. Um, you can also uh, use hashtag Analytica if you want to uh, have a talk about the webinar. Uh, feel free just to put questions through and I'll leave time at the end to, to answer any questions. The uh, materials that I'm going to be showing today as well will be uh, available, um, so if you want to get the whole deck, just email us and, and we'll be happy to send that through. Okay, so that's a quick overview. Introduction to us as Analytica. Um, if you don't know us, we are a London-based software a company and uh, we've been in the, in the business for uh, nine years now. We work with a range of clients, um, mainly in Europe and the US and also Canada and uh, we have a software that helps clients find influencers, build relationships with them, but we also have a, a, an insights team so we provide uh, reports and analysis for clients as well. And uh, as you can see, we work with quite a wide range of clients. Uh, most of our work is actually B2B, um, but we also work with a number of B2C companies as well. And uh, you can see a couple of our uh, founders and uh, investors on the screen and our CEO, Tim. So that's a bit about us. I'm not going to spend a long time talking about us. So just moving on now. So if you've joined this webinar and you're really not familiar with influencer marketing and you're wondering why people should do influence marketing, I'm not really aiming this at you, sorry, um, because I think this question has been around for a while. and. Um, Maybe a year and a half ago, you know, we were doing more basic questions about why to do influencer marketing, but I think the, the whole industry has moved on now, and what we're finding more and more companies talking about is they get that influencer marketing is important. They might be wondering how relevant is, it, it is in the B2B context, because I think a lot of the, the limelight and attention on influencer marketing as a category really has been focused on the uh, consumer space. Um, but now people are really starting to think about, right, we know we need to do it, but how do we actually get about get started? In, in getting a program set up and what does it actually look like. So uh, we have got, we've got loads of materials on our site if you're really unfamiliar with what influence marketing is. Um, so you know, please check that out. But I'm kind of assuming that everyone listening to this webinar has got some base understanding. And also that hopefully you've done a bit of preparatory work just to think about what influencer engagement might look like. But just to then go through a few of the key uh, things that you need to, to have done or to do as part of your preparatory work, the top one maybe blindingly obvious here, but it says know your objectives. So when you're thinking about engaging with influencers, really think about why. What is it you're wanting to get out of it? Some clients are wanting to um, just to, to raise their overall profile. It's kind of just part of a wider you know, PR reputation piece. Uh, sometimes it's got very specific objectives, like it's trying to engage with a particular stakeholder group. It can be also partly uh, to do with recruitment, so making sure that potential grads uh, know you and know your company in a certain way and think of you as a desirable place to work, etc. Uh, it can also be part of um, sometimes an account-based marketing strategy. You know, if you're a B2B brand and you've got some really big clients, influencer engagement uh, can also be part of just building relationships with some of your larger accounts or your partners or even some of your suppliers or other people in the, in the field that, that matter to your business. And so in the, in the consumer space, um, you know, th there can be a variety of things that you know, people will, will think about when they're looking to engage with influencers. Quite often it is really about sort of, you know, pushing a particular product or a brand and it, it maybe is more aligned with what traditional advertising would be about, but instead of a billboard, you have a person and you're, you're effectively paying them to, to occupy a part of their social media feed. So second point in here, and I'll come back to this a bit more later in the talk, um, is to know your topics. 
So if you want to start engaging with influencers, you really need to know what the topics are that you're going to be engaging your influencers on, because that's key to actually finding your influencers. And don't just think about it in terms of top line headings. We often get briefs from clients who want to, to, to work with us or for, for us to help them find influencers, and we get like you know maybe three words as their brief, and they're very broad topics. Don't do that. Really think through your topics and work through them in detail. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about how to do that. Another key thing is to plan your calendar. So um, in, again, maybe in the B2C space, it can sometimes work that you may be able to start an influencer engagement exercise maybe two weeks before you actually have a campaign to run. Uh, you find your influencers, you just check some criteria with them, agree on some terms, pay them, send the content in advance, and then they post the stuff on a certain date and it kind of works and you get some engagement. And you know, it does work. Um, it's, it can be quite effective. But we're not really talking about those sort of timelines in the B2B space. So Think ahead, look at the influencers you want to build relationships with and you know, get in early. Start building the relationships with them now if you've got something several months down the line. Don't wait until a couple of weeks beforehand to start trying to tap them up unless maybe you're, you are looking to just sort of throw money at them, which uh, often money is the thing that you have to spend in exchange for having planned early enough in advance and actually started to try and build your relationships. Uh, that's not to say that you can't actually start to engage with influencers on a short timeline, but if you want to start really getting results from um, the engagement work that you're doing, really plan ahead. Uh, think six months back and six months forward when you're looking at timings as well. So another key thing in terms of identifying the right influencers is to think about the key things that those influencers would have been talking about over the last six months. So um, you know, if you're going to work with us or with anyone else, like an agency, to do a, a B2B influencer marketing um, exercise, think about what are the events and the key stories that those influencers would have been talking about in the last six months. Those would be very important to use as part of your ident identification and, and mapping exercise. But then also think six months ahead. So try and think about the big events, um, maybe technical um, innovations perhaps that you might be expecting to come to, come to, the, to the fore maybe in the, in the next six months. And um, use some of those because people will start to talk about those future events as well. The key thing as well with this is that you could obviously do a year back and a year forward. I'm just suggesting six months because I think um, that that's a reasonable time frame because it, is, it covers a whole 12-month period then. Point five on here, engage your team. So do not think of the whole influencer engagement piece as just something that's going to be done by the marketing team or the PR team. The most effective influencer engagement programs that we've seen our clients do are where it's a real team effort and you've got multiple stakeholders in business involved in working with influencers. So figure out who in your business are the subject matters. You know, who are your own influencers? Who, if you're going to do a B2B campaign on, um, I don't know, on, uh, on uh, you know, GDPR or data protection, who in your business is the expert on data protection? And, and how can you then actually work with them to get them involved in some of your content marketing activity, even if they're nothing to do with marketing, as long as they've got expertise. They don't even need to have a you know, social profile right now. Um, them getting started on social media could be part of it. I'll talk a bit about that um, later as well. Another key thing, point six here, is to think about your offer. So other than just throwing money at influencers, which you know, might be the right thing to do in some cases, and I don't mean you actually throw the money, but um, Think about what you can actually offer the influencers. What is it that you can offer as a brand? I think many times we see some of the clients we're working with have actually got a lot of things that they can bring to the table that influencers are going to really value and really want to engage with that doesn't involve a monetary trans transaction. And also, quite often in the B2B context, many of the real influencers, if they are just asking for money, quite often aren't the right influencers to actually engage with. So I'll talk about that in a moment as well. So, Lots of different types of influencers to engage with. Um, this is a, a kind of cascade of different influencers. So um, everyday influencers, those are just uh, you know, people on the street who might be customers. Um, and we do see some very effective uh, consumer brands actually looking out for um, just customers who are maybe not influential, but they're genuine and they really love the brand and they could be great to engage with. It's right through to the other end of the spectrum where you've got celebrities who obviously you know, won't get out of bed for anything less than a six-figure sum. So, we're looking at a broad range. Um, typically speaking, though, I rarely see B2B influencers really going for the everyday influencers or the celebrities. We're mainly talking about those middle four bands. And today, I really want to focus on these two types of influencers. So brand advocates, so people who are um, experts in a particular field and actually like what you're doing as a brand, and also micro-influencers, so people who have got credibility on a very specific topic. Um, 
but you may well find that there are some professional influencers, and by that I mean people who are really looking to earn money from their influence. So in other words, those are the more type, more, more the sort of types who might, um, you know, just want to be be paid for their their activity or their their partnership with you. And macro influencers, um, you know, there are some. Uh, B2B, uh, these, these might be senior execs in, in some large firms who've got for large large reach. So we're not really talking about those two categories, we're mainly focusing on the two um, that are highlighted in red. So then a couple of things to think about when looking for B2B influencers, so when you're actually going about identifying which influencers to work with. So um, first point here, many of the real influencers don't worry about being quote unquote influential. Now. What I mean by that is the word influencer has kind of entered the vernacular now in a sense that it, it actually is synonymous with someone on social media looking to get paid to post stuff uh, for a brand um, or looking to or someone on social media who's got a, a, an audience, a large audience, and, um, and it gets lots of engagement in everything they post. And actually, many people who are really influential don't have much social profile, and influence often is in the context of um, a very specific topic, and that particular topic might not have you know many thousands of people, but it has important people who have got influence within their companies or within their field of academia or within the political sphere or whatever it could be. So what I'm saying here is that a lot of the real influences that, that you might want to engage with as a brand might not have large followings or I might not really be too worried about making sure they, they follow best practice in terms of using hashtags. So it can sometimes be really good to actually have a very different approach to finding influencers than you might have in the B2C space, where you're not necessarily looking for people who've got a high reach or high levels of engagement, but you're looking for people who've got engagement from other people who are talking about a very specific topic. So um, many of the platforms out there, I think, really struggle to find influencers for B2B marketers because they're, they're just focusing on those more... Um, obvious kind of metrics looking at things like reach engagement, which can be very important in the B2B space, but they are often a distraction and can actually, um, if those are the only focus, um, really make it hard to find the influences that can bring value to your brand. Second point here is don't have a one-size-fits-all criteria for choosing influencers. So if you're working with an agency or you're working with us, um, you might have a criteria, say, I want influencers that meet these sort of criteria, so they have you know, an audience in this market, they have this minimum number of followers, et cetera, et cetera. It's highly unlikely that across all the different objectives and things that you might want to do, there's going to be one set of criteria that's going to work for all of your influencer engagement um, activities that you have in mind. So you may have some big hero piece of content that you want to make a big splash with, and you want to engage with some influencers to help amplify that. So in that circumstance, then absolutely, you want influencers who love sharing content, who've got a large reach, got lots of engagement, and they can just give you a nice boost. And, and, and I think we, as on Analytica, we do, we do that quite well. When we often publish our, our list, we just did one today, um, many times the influencers that we, uh, we know on that topic help boost our content, and, and um, we wouldn't get anywhere near the sort of reach that we, we do get without influencers giving us a boost. So absolutely, that's important. But if you are looking to do a webinar on a very specific topic, the influencers who've got a large following, large number, a large amount of engagement, may have that large following, large engagement, mainly because they are just good at social media, not necessarily because they're really experts on the topics they're talking about. They may use, so rather than actually you know, writing white papers, working with clients, they're spending their time on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, whatever it is, and so they've got a large audience because their expertise really is social media marketing. Whereas for your webinar, that's not really going to draw people necessarily to listen to your webinar or actually make the webinar really interesting. So you may want to find people who've got actually a small following, but they post regularly. They always stay up to date with the latest events. They're always bringing something new to the conversation. And importantly, they're getting engaged from other people who are focused on those topics. So make sure that you think about different criteria that matter in relation to the objectives that you've got. Do not just try and have a one-size-fits-all um, approach in terms of uh, deciding who to work with. So third point on here, going back to something I said earlier, really take time to think through your topics. So a bad brief that we might get would be a client saying, I want cybersecurity influencers, and they just go and stick in a word like cybersecurity into a tool, and, and they'll get back you know, a bunch of influencers. Quite often what we'll see is that people who are really focusing on cybersecurity don't always bother to put the word cybersecurity in their post. They will put um, stuff in to do with whatever the top issue of the day is. And so it's often actually 
it's this sound, this can sound counterintuitive, but sometimes if you want to find real influencers on a topic, um, subject matter experts, you almost want to avoid using what I call the lazy hashtag. So if you want to find cybersecurity influencers um, who actually really are in-depth subject matter experts, sometimes it can be good to make sure that you're actually writing a search string that doesn't have the word cybersecurity in it and doesn't have the word infrastructure in it. But what it does have is it has specific things to do with chip security or um, a latest patch release or a latest um, you know, piece of ransomware that's come out or a, a new piece of legislation or a, um, a particular um, niche technology provider who's doing something cool um, or an event that's coming up. So really try to think around your topic and finding those more specialist terms that only the real experts are going to talk about will really help you find um, um, some subject matter experts that are, that are not the obvious candidates. So onto this question about paid versus organic. So should you pay? Um, in the B2C space, I think probably most of the influence engagements happen on a, on a paid space or it's some kind of gifting scheme. Um, but you know, organic engagement can still be valid in a, in a B2C space. But really we see in the B2B space, often the organic engagement can be the real way forward. Um, but there are some times when, when paid approach can work. Or the paid might m be more the case of covering someone's expenses, for example, if they're traveling over to, to a conference on the other side of the world, or that, that sort of thing. Or there's some other kind of um, payment in kind. But bear in mind, many of the influencers that we're talking about in a B2B context are not necessarily there to make money from their social media influence. They are influential on social media because they're actually good at their day job. They have a senior role in a big company, or they are you know, writing very detailed blog articles, or they're a consultant. And actually the reason they are, uh, they might be an independent consultant, and the reason that they are on social media is to win business from clients. They're not trying to get paid to, to post something for a brand. What they're looking to is just to be seen as a subject matter expert, to then be invited to come in to talk to brands um, and offer their services to brands. Um, or it could be that they are a, an influencer and they're an evangelist for a brand. And they are there to represent the company that they work for. Um, and so it could be someone who's actually in an evangelist role at a large company, or it could be someone in a smaller business who is, you know, is the CEO or the founder and they just need to get out there and get the word out about their company. And, and, and it's also just part of their personal branding. So there's lots of different reasons why B2B influencers are going to want to be engaging with brands, getting um, exposure online. And so you know, those sort of influencers don't really want to get paid. They just want to help boost their own um, profile or boost the profile of their brand. Or it could also be that there's some particular cause or campaign. Um, a lot of the B2B influencer engagement is actually around CSR activities. Uh, so obviously today's um, International Women's Day, uh, which is great. Sorry, you've got to listen to a bloke today. <laughs> um, but uh, they, you know, there could be loads of, there are lots of businesses doing stuff around uh, International Women's Day, and there could be loads of um, women influencers who just want to go out there and, and help encourage more businesses to take on uh, women in, in senior roles, in tech roles, etc. So you know, make sure that you are aligning the paid versus organic approach with the sort of influencers that you're looking to engage with. And if you are looking to do to go down the organic route, you need to think about what value you're bringing to the influencer. So um, how can you help them deliver value to their audience? So that could be um, helping them create content that they couldn't otherwise create, helping them boost their knowledge, helping them learn things, giving them access to your senior execs. It can also be about increasing their influence and personal brand. So sometimes you as a brand may actually have a great reach of your own. And just by working with influencers, you can actually help boost the influencers. You can help them raise their network, get uh, raise the awareness of what they're doing. So there's often lots of things that you can do as a brand in a non-monetary capacity that can really help the influencer achieve something for themselves. And then the other thing is just to really think about how to continue to nurture those relationships and build them organically. So a really useful quote here from uh, Michael Brenner. He says, it's important to focus on finding ways to help the influencer, help them build their brand, help them reach a new audience, and help them gain access to insights and content for their audiences. So build your own equal value partnership framework. Um, I can't actually see this slide very well on my screen. <laughs> Hopefully it looks right on yours. Um, but again, if you want to get this deck, just uh, get in touch with us and we can send it over. But um, this is just an example sort of framework. So you might want to think about um, giving influencers early access to some research that you've done. Um, some brands have got the resources to go and do very extensive surveys and ask lots of questions. And it might be that there are some influencers who would love to be able to add some questions to your survey. 
um, and therefore, uh, or to have a quote in the, or to be able to get early access to your survey to give their own take on it. Um, it could be that um, some of these influencers would love to be able to have a direct access to some of your senior execs. Bear in mind, obviously, you know, your senior exec's time is precious, so be selective about which influencers you connect in that way. Um, and obviously think about it beyond just journalists, I think, which is often the kind of default route, maybe sometimes is to you know, get the journalist access to the senior execs, but there may, may be other types of influencers who can really um, add value to as a brand who would love that access. And then also think about how you can bring value to the influencers. So thinking about, um, for example, video content. Some uh, brands we work with have actually got their own recording studios and have got really great um, setup for filming stuff. And that actually could be something that they could offer an influencer to allow the influencer to actually use their recording studio to make some of their own materials, or it could be to invite them into uh, to do a podcast. So this isn't just about um, you know bringing influencers in to help with your content. Think about what you can do to also help the influencer make their own content and make their content better, because they, they will really appreciate that. But um, you know, use this sort of framework um, to uh, fill it in with the, the things that you can offer to the influencers, and also what you think you can get um, back from them in return going to grab a glass of water. So here are some different influencer engagement models. And uh, some of these, as you can see, will be uh, financially focused. Some are, are more organic. But today I want to focus really on these three particular models for today. So these are, I think, where B2B brands can really get started in terms of engaging with influencers. I'm going to spend some more time going through these three in, in more detail. So first of all, one of the ways in which you can get started as a, um, as a B2B brand to engage with influencers is to invite influencers to your events. So thinking about what, what I said at the very beginning about planning, think about your events that are coming up. Um, which of those events could be really interesting for the influencers that you want to engage with? Um, and you can invite them to, to, to attend the event. Um, interestingly, I had a conversation with a client uh, yesterday about an influencer um, who they didn't name who um, was, they, was asking for payments to come to an event and was also asking for payments based on sort of how many hundred tweets they posted out during the day about the event. Now, yes, maybe sometimes that can be worthwhile doing if you want to you know, get a boost on Twitter, for example. But really, if that's the sort of the thing that an influencer wants, I would question whether that's the right sort of influencer to bring to an event. If you can organize an event that's got really interesting um, subject matter um, and also is bringing other influencers to the event, that can often be really valuable. And I'll give a, a case in a moment of, of an event run by a client that, that, that got a number of influencers and, and really helped them build relationships. The key thing as well is when you're in the early stages of your engagement program is to think about the event primarily as a relationship builder not necessarily that you're bringing the influencers to your event to give your event a massive boost, um, but that, which might happen. Hopefully, they'll come to the event and they'll talk about it, they'll post about it on LinkedIn, tell people they're coming, tweet about it during the event, you know, maybe increase the chance of it trending or appearing in, in other people's feeds, that sort of thing. So that, that's great, but often it's good to, especially when it's in the early stages, to see the event as a chance to actually meet some of these influencers, find out what they're like um, in person, get them to connect with some of your um, internal subject matter experts, which leads on to uh, this point as well, is that when you are um, looking to build these early relationships, is to think about ways to co-create content with influencers. So that might be um, the example I gave just before where you've got a, a survey or a big piece of um, research that you're looking to publish, and it can be useful to seed some of that content with influencers give them access to it in advance so they can have their own take on it ready to publish on their own channel, or they can add con comments to your piece of content. Uh, but it's also important to really think about um, how can you help the influencer create content. And different influencers will be worth, um, it will be, should be engaged with in different ways. So you might have an influencer, for example, who's got a great network on a topic, um, they've got good reach, but they're not really you know, an in-depth subject matter expert. So that might be the sort of influencer you could invite to come and interview one of your experts. So the influencer's holding the mic and they're asking the questions, but it's one of your people actually answering the questions. Or it could be the other way around, that you find an influencer who maybe you know, is not, not a, you know, a huge celebrity online, but they really know their subject and you want to go out and uh, interview them and ask them for their opinion. Um, or it could be that 
um, you've actually got some really good data, um, and you know you've used your data to create uh, white papers, etc. But there's maybe more stuff that could be done with your data. So you find an influencer who loves analyzing data, writes very detailed blog posts about data. You know, give them access to data that other influencers don't have access to, so they can create unique content. Um, it could also be access to uh, video imagery. Um, giving them access to your resources. So think about how you can start to help influencers make content, but make their own content better, and also how you can involve them in even sometimes just light touch ways, like providing quotes um, in your content. So it, it looks like you've taken the influencer community into mind uh, in, in mind uh, when you've made your content. What we also see happen is that when brands do that, they've actually got a ready-made distribution network when they come to publish their content. And again, that's what we find with our content that when we publish. Um, an article, many of the influencers in that space know that we were going to publish it, and they then go and share it online. And so, and it happens very quickly, and, and it gets us a great boost. And uh, you know, we, we get you know, thousands of people um, sharing our, our articles sometimes because of that. And both of those um, points link into this third point here, which is about fostering relationships between influencers and your internal experts. So it might be the case that the first interaction that you have as a brand with an influencer is not an invitation to an event. It's not something coming from the marketing team or the PR team to do a piece of content. It's actually one of your internal experts just having a conversation with an influencer, either on LinkedIn or Twitter or on their blog, maybe even Instagram, who knows? I know there could be in Snapchat, who knows? Um, so just try and foster those relationships. And the way to do that is to find people internally who are not afraid of being online. They don't necessarily have to have a huge following, but they, they actually it's more to see that there's a willingness for them to start sharing. Some of your internal subject matter experts may in time actually become influencers in their own right on the topics that you care about as a brand. They may never become influencers, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't think about involving them in your influencer program because they could be the key to building relationships with influencers that you do care about, um, external influencers that you do care about. And so if there is an influencer on a particular topic, let's say um, you've got an academic who's an expert on some medical device. So uh, we've done a piece of research recently on um, radiology experts, so people who are experts on radiology, because uh, you know, it's a medical uh, company who makes equipment, and they've got their own internal experts on radiology. Now, if they engage with radiology experts as a brand, they might get a you know an, an influencer going, hmm, you know, I'm not really bothered with engaging with you at a brand level, but if they have someone from that company who is an expert in that field engaging with them, many of these influencers want to engage with people who know what they're talking about. So they will respond to someone who they can see in their bio is an expert in the same field. So key thing from your point of view, if you're listening to this as a marketing or PR person, is to help your internal subject matter experts get their profile right. So it's very clear what their subject uh, of expertise is and, and, and that they, on their feed, start to post a few posts so that an influencer looking at them sees that they are actually talking about subjects that are relevant to that influencer. Um, it's more important if you've got a, an internal subject matter expert that they are posting content on their feed that's relevant to their area, area of expertise than just pumping out whatever your brand channel is posted out. So if you're a brand that covers a whole range of topics, um, like maybe you're some consultancy firm covering a whole range of topics, and you've got an influencer who's an expert on tax, it's going to be much more worthwhile them sharing just the content that's really focused on tax or sharing um, not just content from your brand about tax, but they need to be focused on and have a profile that aligns um, with them as a tax expert. Because if a tax influencer uh, looks at their profile and they see just a whole range of nonsense um, uh, or just a whole range of stuff that's nothing to do with tax, they might go, yeah, why am I going to follow that person? Whereas if they see that influencer actually writing some of their own thoughts, you know, sharing some of their opinions, they're more likely to follow that influencer. Even if they don't have a large following, they're going to think, ah, oh, this is a person who works in the same field as me. They've got a full-time job in this field. They work at a brand I recognize. They might have something useful for me. I might, you know, this might be interesting to engage with them. So that's the key thing, is to try and make sure that you, the profiles of your experts align with the topics that they're experts on, um, as well as just you know, thinking about um, basic training for them so that they're not afraid to go in line. Um, when you're looking at your internal subject matter experts, don't pressurize them into thinking that suddenly they need to be an influencer. And also, don't go, they don't need to worry about having lots of engagement. What they need to just think about is getting engagement from the influencers that, that you're pairing them up with. So maybe just give them each 10 influencers that really matter in their field. They may already know them, which would be great. They may not know them. Um, and it may be that you, you've, you've helped find these other experts and influencers through maybe working with someone like us or an agency or just done it yourself. 
and then you can say, look, here are 10 people that you want to follow with. Um, focus on trying to talk to those people because we know these are the ones who are really setting the agenda. So that's the sort of stuff to do to help uh, get those conversations started. And obviously, if you're then organizing an event and the influencer comes, try and get your own expert to, them, to the event as well so they can meet face to face and have a chat about tax or something else equally as exciting. Um, but again, if you're co-creating content, it might be that that could be an interview there, you know, that the influencer can in interview your expert or vice versa, or they could all take part in a panel conversation on a webinar, for example. So try and think about how you can use your influencer engagement to actually foster relationships with individuals at your brand. It's a, it's a lot easier actually to do this in a B2B context than in a consumer context. Um, some consumer um, organizations actually do this really well, especially when it's part of a, a CSR ex exercise or um, be building relationships with key um, stakeholder groups or a part of a recruitment context. But I think B2B brands have actually got an advantage here in terms of being able to build these sort of relationships. So just to look at a couple of case studies here. So um, this is a client, Thomson Reuters, that we um, have worked together um, alongside an agency called OST, uh, who organized an event where they looked to um, invite some people who are experts on regulation, regulation technology. So we uh, identified uh, 30 influencers on the topic of uh, reg tech, and they invited them to this um, event uh, looking at, uh, in a, these were influencers in risk and compliance, and they invited a bunch of influencers to come along to the event and actually gave out some awards uh, for their social media profile and their, and their activity. So it was great for the influencers, they could all come and meet, and many of them had, were meeting other reg tech influencers for the first time in person. They knew each other online, but because of the event that Thomson Reuters had organized, they were now able to actually meet these people in, in person. So it was great to give them a boost in terms of building relationships between the influencers and between the brand and between people at the brand. And as a result, they, they got uh, a really great uh, reach from the event itself. But more importantly, they had the start of a, a much more long-term um, engagement. And, um, and the, the key influencers there, sorry, there was the, the sort of five key influencers that they, that they gave the awards to, they, they then have had ongoing uh, success in terms of engaging with those influencers. Looking at uh, VMware now, um, this is where they use um, online events like uh, their own crowd chat platform um, to invite influencers into an online conversation. And as a result, the influencers also shared that they were having these um, conversations. And because it was very relevant um, to specific topics, they got really good in interaction um, from people who were focused on that topic. And they've done these repeatedly and seen a really good um, increase in brand awareness. Um, and again, I'm not going to read through everything on, on the slides, so um, just let us know if you want, to, want these slides and we will send them over. And we've got some other slides that we, we can't uh, use in this webinar, but we can send the details across afterwards as well. And uh, just another thing with VMware where they looked to do, they, they changed their whole approach to uh, content creation, that a lot of what they did was actually to um, use their email marketing distribution list, for example, to start um, sharing um, uh, content that the influencers had made and to actually push some of their own traffic to the influencers and of course that was great for the influencers and then the influencers started to uh, reciprocate reciprocate so the uh, the net result of this was that they actually saw a 70% increase in uh, click throughs for um, uh, brands um, that's the actual content they had on the site they saw um, a, a number of influencers just organically posting about them as a brand which is a, a, a really good result, and uh, and that that this, this has continued to, to grow. This is from last year, but uh, I know from from this they've managed to continue to to see more organic uh, content being created about what they do um, in a, in a in a positive way from the influencers, which is is actually much more credible if the third party is saying something good about your brand rather than you just saying it about yourself. So just to um, feel free to start um, firing through uh, questions because I'm just on the last couple of slides. I'm not going to go through these all in detail. I um, just wanted to uh, give a few more slides, giving some more detail about uh, different approaches to um, influencer engagement. And so just to kind of recap a bit, this this point here about influencer-generated content. So this is where the focus of the influencer engagement is really around content creation. So the key um, step here at the start is to make sure you research those topics. So think in detail about what the uh, issues are now and what the issues are in the future that are going to be relevant to, to your target audience. And then take time doing the mapping exercise to actually go and identify the relevant influences and 
um, and then think about how you can sort of co-create content with them, build influences with them um, by interacting with them on their own channels. So again, that's where you can bring your own internal experts into the mix is that you start having a conversation with the influencer maybe on their LinkedIn page um, through one of your own internal um, experts. And it might be that you know, if you want to invite them to an event, the invite comes one-to-one -one, um, through LinkedIn, for example. And uh, then you want to make sure that, uh, just at the end here, that there's, there's a way to measure the effect of this. So um, there will be some more general ways to measure the impact of your content. So you, you want to look at things like uh, you know, click-throughs, uh, leads generated, uh, the, all, all the usual stuff, and impressions, et cetera, views, um, uh, click, uh, shares, et cetera, et cetera. But other metrics to consider when you're looking at this as part of an influencer engagement program is to look at influencer engagement specifically. So if you've identified, let's say, the top 100, 200 influencers on a key topic, look at your brand share of voice amongst those influencers. Look at how often they're sharing your content. So content sharing, um, all the other metrics that you do, just generally have a lens on that that then zooms in to um, engagements from the target influencers. And um, more sort of generally speaking, looking at a relationship-led influencer marketing approach. Um, these are the sort of things that um, you want to be considering. So looking at sort of uh, the timeline here as well. So we've got sort of a 12-week timeline. So you might want to do the sort of week one starting to build out those personas. So going back to the, the sort of first slide I had in terms of the proprietary work, that's when you want to start spending some time looking at that, looking at where the um, engagements from the influencers can make an impact. Um, and then do, do take time, um, it could be a, you know, a week and a couple of meetings within that week to think about the key themes, um, plan out the, the key channels that you're going to work on. Um, maybe also if you have some internal subject matter experts, divvy up the channels between your experts. So you may have um, some experts who are just going to you know, only, only manage one channel as their focus. So try and get a few influencers who may be comfortable focusing on LinkedIn, but make sure you have a couple who are going to focus on, um, on Twitter. Um, you may have some other microblogging platforms that you're using, um, and try and get influencers posting on those as well. And if you've got events or more visual content, um, you, know, you may have some who, who um, have content that's suitable for Instagram or other more image-focused um, sites. Sometimes Pinterest could be good as well if you want to have um, infographics, for example, work quite well on Instagram, uh, sorry, on Pinterest because they can be searchable and reused, um, and that they sort of don't, don't tend to do better in um, search results than Instagram, for example. So that, that's just a timeline. I'm not going to go through all of that in detail, but um, just wanted to give this as an example of the sort of timeline that we will work uh, we will develop with a client to think about how they can actually uh, go about um, building um, relationships with influencers and start to get um, an impact from those engagements. So just to wrap up here, um, thinking about the uh, content example, um, it's my penultimate slide here. So when you're going to do your brand introduction, um, it's often best to do that at a, at a person, personal level rather than a brand level. Um, try and also start to acknowledge some of the influencers. So um, you can mention the influencers in your in your content um, when you when you share a link, uh, mentioning them you know, at mention them so they know that you're talking about them, and invite them to contribute to content, um, and then start to think about a, a modular approach when you are um, doing some of your larger form content. So I mean this is this is nothing new, but if you've got a large piece of content, try and break it down into smaller items, and, and look at ways in which you can start to get influencer engagement on some of the, the specific um, sections of content that you've broken down. And um, if you also then want to um, start to uh, think about events, there may be some smaller roundtable events that you can use which are more going to be about relationship building. Um, and do those then before you have the bigger event that you want to then really get a bigger bang. So smaller events, smaller, more intimate events to, to, to build a relationship. Um, and then the bigger event is where you, the influencers may, you know, quote unquote, return the favor and actually then helping sort of boost the uh, profile of your brand um, in the event that you're running or taking part in, maybe you're exhibiting at a conference, that sort of thing. Okay, so those are just some um, ideas. I'm getting some questions coming through, so I'll just um, leave the slide on the screen here, um, just as a recap. Um, and then I'll start um, picking up some of these questions, so do feel free to um, fire them through, and we'll have a look on Twitter, see if anyone's got, got us on there as well. Um, if you think of a question afterwards, or you're listening to this um, rec uh, rec recording later, um, do feel free just to email me or, or get in touch. We're happy to take questions. So the question is, um, so I work at a startup that most of the bigger influencers probably haven't heard of. 
what would be a good strategy for getting their attention. Okay, so um, yeah, well, yeah, we're we've, we're a startup as well, and um, so this is relevant to us. So I think with the, if you are a big brand, obviously it can be nice that influencers, you know, want to be associated with you as a brand because uh, everyone's heard of you, you've got a big reach. But smaller startups sometimes are the ones actually really doing the innovation and have got something cool to do, and the influencers can can be really interested to know what the next big thing is. So. Provided that you're doing something innovative and groundbreaking, um, you can you can get influencers engaged because what you're you're doing is, is really interesting. But again, it's tricky because there can be lots of other startups trying to get their attention as well. So sometimes you actually just need to make you know make the effort to actually get to the events where these influencers are going to be at. So um, if you've got influencers that you're looking to target. Um, map them out, look at where they're going, and it may be that actually the way to start building a relationship with them is just to try and um, you know, meet them in person at an event, or, or actually just to try boosting their content. So if you start sharing their content, uh, you start using their material um, in, in, in your content, obviously you know, referencing that, that it's from them, not just plagiarizing them, um, that can start to, to get you on their radar, um, especially if you um, have got and you gradually started to build up your own channel, um, you can start to boost it. And maybe that you also need to not start with the top tier influencers, but maybe start for the ones um, maybe sort of more in the middle who um, don't necessarily work with large brands right now. Um, and they maybe um, want to, uh, to, 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 to work with a smaller company like yours. Uh, another question here. Um, how do you see B2B influencer marketing evolving over the next three to five years? Oof. Um, so, um, well, I obviously think that influencer marketing is going to be um, a huge part of all B2B marketing. Um, so I think B2B influencer marketing is going to become a much more of a, a central thing, and it won't really be called influencer marketing. It will just be B2B marketing, because it will all be about engaging with influencers, because uh, all of the content creation will need to be done together with influencers. I think no brand is really going to be able to just insulate themselves and do their own thing. They'll always need to be doing it in conjunction with um, third parties, uh, external influencers, in order to get the right sort of credibility in the marketplace. They're not just you know, singing their own praises. And I think another key thing that we're going to see more of is that um, B2B brands are going to be less worried about their own staff using their own social channels. Some brands have embraced this years ago, and they have huge programs involved in boosting employee advocacy. The problem I see, though, is that many of those brands, it's not really employee advocacy. It's just employee amplification. It's just the central brand pumping stuff out and hoping that loads of the staff will repost it on LinkedIn, retweet it on Twitter, etc., um, which is okay. But really, um, the, the way to make it really effect, effective um, is to see the um, employee advocacy being about employees building relationships with influencers in their own right, so that the influencer has a relationship with people at the brand, not just at the brand. So I think that the role of the um, marketing person and the PR person, increasingly those roles are going to you know, overlap. They're going to be... You know, one and the same, um, because the PR person isn't just about working with journalists, and the marketing person isn't just about you know avoiding the journalists because the PR person has the rights to talk to them uh, only. It's going to be about having a more fluid approach to influencer engagement, and the role of the marketing and the PR person is going to be less about the. Um, if you think about this as a like an, an I've used the example of a, an orchestra, it's less about the PR person or the marketing person being the lead singer. You know, they're the one. You know, they're the voice of the company. It's more going to be about the company having multiple voices, and the role of the marketing and PR person is more of a conductor. They're there in front of the choir. They're not the one leading the singing. They're the one making sure that everyone is singing in tune, and that different parts of the choir sing at the right time, um, so that collectively, you know, they're, they're, they have a, a much louder voice and they're much more impactful. So it's about trying to make sure that they get the right people in internally talking with the right people externally. So I think that the role of influencer marketing is going to be more for the marketing person about just choreography, making sure everything runs in sync and making sure that the events um, have got the right participation in. Um, and it's going to be more about different experts in the business taking responsibility for the marketing activity of that um, division and not just leaving it up to the marketing team. So if that's my ideal. Um, I'd love to see that happen. <laughs> Get back to me in three years and see whether I'm right. So. Um, how, another question, how much control should you retain when working with influencers or should you give them free reign to create content they, how they see fit? Ooh, um, 
good questions here. So I would say that the most impactful content, I mean, we work with a large uh, tech client who I know took a very, I think, risky but ultimately rewarding approach in actually directly looking to engage with hostile competitors, so, uh, so hostile influencers who actually were really fans of their competitor. And they had you know, left them as a, as a brand you know, years previously because they, they kind of moved away from them. And they then just said, you know, give us another try. And they just let those influencers say what they want. Um, some of them you know, carried on being hostile, but some of them have actually come around. And the ones that have come around and start now talking positively about this brand, who I can't mention, um, hoping to have a little awesome case study published on this though, but um, it's amazing to see the credibility that they've got and the way that they've managed to, particularly with certain tech um, group, have managed to really change perceptions of them as a brand because the influencers were free to say what they wanted to about the brand. So obviously it depends on how the relationship is. If it's just a case of, you know, like, like the one I described, where you're looking to really change perceptions, win people over who are hostile, you can't expect to go and tell them what to do because that will probably backfire and they'll then end up being more hostile. But if you are actually entering, especially if there's an actual commercial ag arrangement and you're paying the money, then fair enough, um, you know, it's probably right to expect that you, know, you may have some control. But I think particularly in the B2B space, people see through that. And I think it's coming more and more in the consumer space that people are getting wise to paid endorsements. So it's much better if the influencer, if they're saying something good about you, maybe also says a little bit negative about you. And it isn't all just um, you know, a lovely kind of commentary about you as a brand. Because people are going to more like, be more likely to believe something about you if there's you know, some, some good as, um, uh, mixed in with a little bit of bad. Hopefully not too bad, too much bad. Um, but I think that credibility, what you lose in control, you gain in credibility. Uh, I think I've got time for uh, one more question here. So, um, when mapping influencers, have you come across a situation where an influencer is working with two companies which could be seen as competitors? Um, absolutely, yes. Um, and quite often in the B2B space, um, if the, the, the top influencers don't really want to be aligned just with one brand because that's going to damage their credibility. And if they are, you know, so again, the, the value that an influencer brings if you're working with them as a brand, is credibility, authenticity. And if they are just singing your praises and they never say anything good about a competitor, then, um, then that, that people are less likely to believe them. Whereas if people are listening to an influencer who they know um, says positive things about multiple brands and might occasionally be critical of a brand, then they're more likely to be believed when they say something good about you. So that's again the other thing where I'd say be a little bit wary sometimes of influencers who just want to get money because sometimes the influencers who just want to get money from brands are often hesitant to say anything negative about a brand because they're worried that that brand might not then pay them in the future. So um, often those sort of influencers for hire are sometimes just you know, saying wonderful things about every brand, um, hoping that those brands will eventually pay them money. So um, you, you, you may want to actually look for influencers who may from time to time be critical. So yes, it's risky, um, but again, as long as there isn't really a, an affiliation with you and the brand, like we've seen you know, with um, uh, PewDiePie and Disney and other you know, famous influencers in the consumer space where they've actually had a, a commercial relationship with the influencer and then the influencers, influencer said something really unsavory, then that's had a really negative impact on the brand. So if you don't have that sort of commercial ambassador relationship with the influencer, then you don't really have that same level of risk if they then go and do something, you know, maybe a little bit unsavory. Um, but um, you, you can benefit if they say something good about you. So you, it's kind of, you, you've got one risk in the sense that they might say something bad about you, but then you've got the other, you don't have the risk in the sense that you're too closely affiliated with them that if they do something wrong. Although hopefully in the B2B space, we're all dealing with grown-ups who don't do those sorts of embarrassing things. Then we all wish. Um, Okay, um, ooh, I'm, I'm struggling to keep up the questions now. Um, I might have to send uh, these out on social uh, or email after. So um, I think I do have more time for, for more questions. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I am getting a nod. Okay, so um, are there some influencers who are better at building your brand awareness and others who are better at driving sales? Mm, um, well, yes. Yeah, so I think the ones that are better at driving sales maybe are the ones who are actually putting in a link specifically to your sales campaign. Some influencers will do that just because, you know, they, they're happy to drive business to you. Um, and it's great that there may be some campaign that you're running that actually drives leads um, specifically and you're able to capture the, the result of the influencer's effort. Um, there may be others who are just talking about you. There's no particular link um, or they're not you know, raising the profile of, of an event. So 
it sometimes will just be down to the in individual influencers. Sometimes um, some influencers may just never like actually sending a you know a link out, um, but they will talk about a brand. Um, again, it just depends on the, the kind of profile of the influencer. So, uh, so yes, there are. Um, and you might actually just that, that can also be part of the analysis. So we can and, and and you can do this as well, actually look at influencers and look at how often are they actually sharing links. Some influencers will talk about brands but never actually share um links to an actual um piece of um uh, of an asset of a brand's um website for example. Um whereas others will do that. So um that can be part of the actual uh metrics that you have when when categorizing your influencers. Um when Oh, sorry, I've already answered that one. What is the biggest misconception you've seen brands have about influence marketing? Um, so the biggest misconception is that it is all about paying influencers. So it is sad that um, that B2C influence marketing has, take, has sort of stolen the limelight because I think actually a lot of the really cool stuff is happening in the B2B space. Um, and sometimes I'll go and talk to a B2B marketer who brings their boss into the meeting, the person I'm talking to gets it, and they bring the boss in, and the boss immediately thinks, oh, be influence marketing, that's all about paying influencers. And you just put your hand on your face, and you go, oh. And immediately start thinking of Kim Kardashian or something ridiculous like that. And it's really not just about that. So if you're doing PR, if you're working with anyone outside of your business in a marketing capacity, you are doing influence marketing. That's just it. it that, that's all about influence marketing. It's a very broad category, which is part of the problem, that influence marketing means very different things for def very different uh, groups of people. So it's very important if you start using the word influence marketing. Some clients we work with actually have banned that phrase. They can't use the word influence marketing. They talk about influencer relations because um, especially like in the software development space, the word marketing is a bit of a dirty word and they hate talking about marketing. They, they assume it's all about you know, doing evil things like trying to sell stuff. Um, but uh, they use, you know, they'll talk about influencer relations. So it may be that you, know, you might if the word influence marketing has got negative connotations to it, you may want to come up with some alternative um, in a term. It, you know, it could be influencer relationship uh, management, influencer. Oh, I've seen influence marketing being used. Um, so whatever you call it, it's about working with people who have an impact on your business, who don't work in your company. Um, and uh, so that, that, that could be all sorts of functions. Again, analyst relationships, uh, analyst relations, investor relations, it's all influencer uh, marketing because those are all people that can affect the perception of your brand and you need to think about how you work with them. So the key thing um, as well, another misconception is that these are all separate siloed things. The best um, uh, influencer marketing campaigns are the, and, and programs are the ones that are done in a joined up way and they involve multiple stakeholders within the business. So your PR team is talking with your marketing team, is talking with your analyst relations, talking with your HR, talking with your events teams. They all need to talk together and work together and look at the influencers that you're engaging with and try and have a holistic approach. So I um, hope that is a good way to, to wrap this uh, webinar up. Um, thanks for your questions. Uh, do feel free to get in touch with us afterwards. And um, yeah, I hope, hope uh, we'll be able to have a further conversation with you. Have a good day. Bye-bye.